Chapter 16, part two, starting off with suctioning. Let's do this. We all know what suctioning is there for, all right? We are trying to remove material from the back of the oropharynx. This is to, for those of you who are taking exams, one word that I'm always looking for is the word hurgling. Whenever I see that adjective used in a test question, you best believe I'm looking for suctioning on the answers. Okay. So several different types of devices that we can use for suctioning. We can see them here. All the way on that side, we have a portable manual suction unit. Usually these are called uh, suction vacs or emergency vacs or they have different names for different brands. That's hand powered, right? There's no batteries. Um, the one down here next to me is a battery powered suction unit. So those are typically the ones that we'll be utilizing if we go into someone's home and we have to suction within the home. Um, and the one up top, those are on board. So those are wired in. There's no batteries required. Um, all of them, or at least these two, work identical. Uh, you just got to make sure that we're able to test them in the morning. And if I would recommend you anything, it would to know would be to know how to troubleshoot them in case there's failure. Okay, I've been on plenty of calls where there have been issues with the suction and someone saying that it's not working, it's not working, and there's a leak up on the lid somewhere. So just make sure you test it always in the morning. Um, know how to troubleshoot those. That'll come in handy, I promise you. Got to know your different suction catheters. A hard tip catheter, also known as a yank hour, yank hour tips. That's what you're looking at here in this photo. It says that it's wide bore, thick walled, non kink tubing. Um, this is the best way that I can tell you to always remember which catheter to use is if I can visually see what I'm suctioning, I'm going to be using this catheter. So if I can see it, I'm going to go ahead and size up the catheter. Size up. I don't want to go too far back in the oral pharynx because remember, this will cause a gag reflex, and causing gag reflexes can cause some serious problems, including vomiting. Okay, so I never want to do that. But if I could see it, I'm going for it with this catheter in particular. Next, here, tonsil tip, also known as whistle tip, also known as French tip, also known as soft tip, right? A lot of names for these catheters. This is a catheter that we utilize to get into smaller spaces. And whenever I say that I can't see where this uh, distal tip is going, I'm going to be using a whistle tip, okay, or a soft tip catheter. So let's say I want to suction out uh, through the nose, uh, or if I want to go through an advanced airway, like an intubation tube or something of that sort. I can't see where the distal tip is going, so I will use a soft tip. Okay. Suctioning techniques. Again, do not stimulate the back of the throat. Again, that's the, the biggest thing. We always want to size up this catheter before we utilize it. Uh, we're ensuring that we are not going too far back. I don't want to cause a gag. It says for soft tip catheters must lubricate when suctioning the nasal pharynx. Absolutely. Uh, when best when you pass through the ET tube. I talked about that. And up here it says. After suctioning, continue ventilation and oxygenation. Remember, while we're suctioning, we're unable to ventilate, right? Because we're suctioning. So the old adage is if I am suctioning the oral pharynx, if we're using uh, suctioning for the adult, it's 15 seconds on the way out. For a child, 10 seconds, and then for infant, five. If we're ever suctioning an advanced airway, we suction 10 seconds on advanced airways. Okay, here's an example of somebody um, measuring a yank hour tip there. It says, turn the patient's head to the side, insert the suction catheter to the preterm depth, predetermined depth, and then uh, apply suction in a circular motion. Now, the reason why we put them in a, um, like a log rolled position or on the side is so we can get that fluids to like sit on the side of the patient's mouth 
And hopefully, if there's too much fluids, it'll actually come out of the mouth thanks to gravity. But typically, if there's a lot of fluid built up in the back of somebody's throat, I don't keep them supine. Keeping a patient supine while suctioning um, increases the chance that they're going to aspirate. That was quick. Airway adjuncts. A lot of EMT stuff here, which I kind of expected. But maybe needed to maintain patency in an unresponsive patient's airway okay, after manually opening and suctioning their airway. So it says this is not a substitute for proper head positioning. We still need a head position, but by utilizing an airway adjunct, we can maintain that tongue from blocking our airway. First one here. First one here is OPAs, oral pharyngeal airways. So OPAs are awesome if used correctly. Should be inserted in an unresponsive patient who does not have a gag reflex. I hate to say that sometimes this is when we find out if our patient has a gag reflex. This is very true. Uh, sometimes we're bagging somebody who's unresponsive and then we grab our OPA and we put it in at a 90 degree angle. And when we, when we first introduce that OPA into their mouth, they gag, we take it out. Okay. Hopefully you don't cause any vomiting when that occurs. But again, indications is unresponsive, no gag. Obvious contraindications, responsive and with a gag reflex. So here's somebody properly uh, sizing that from the corner of the mouth to the angle of the mandible. I've also seen from the corner of the mouth to the earlobe. Um, so a couple different ways that I've seen it written in the textbooks. Uh, just make sure we always size it before we insert the OPA. Now, if there's one piece of advice I can give you is when you do place the OPA inside somebody's mouth, if you see it, the, the phalange sticking out of the mouth, like at a pretty considerable distance, that's telling you that it's not wrapped completely around the tongue. So whoever put it in, uh, the tongue is pushing it back up and out of the patient's mouth. So you need to really get back in there and scoop the tongue that's why the OPA is shaped like a hook it around the tongue, and then the OPA won't retract uh, back out of the mouth. Okay, we've already talked about it. Now, there's a couple ways to, in to actually insert this into the patient's mouth. You could either do a full 180 or a 90 degree. Uh, I'm more of a fan of the 90. I think the 180 uh, you have a higher chance of like cutting or irritating the hard palate in the patient's mouth. So just make sure that you have an idea and you're not just shoving that OPA in. Always put it in at a either 90 or 180 and you're going to rotate it. And the whole purpose of that, remember, is to sweep the tongue. You need to get behind that tongue. Someone here using a tongue depressor, not necessary. For most patients, I have told you in part one that some people have like this insanely large tongue. Uh, for some patients, it might make it a little bit easier, but again, not mandatory. NPAs, I'll be honest with you, do not get a ton of play in EMS. Oh, excuse me. So soft rubber tube, um, bevel towards the septum, and we basically... Put them straight back in through the patient's nose. This is another airway adjunct to maintain airway patency. Just make sure you always lubricate these things before use. Indications, unresponsive or altered with a gag reflex. So these patients, um, if I'm ever taking an exam and they say in the exam question that the patient is semi-conscious, semi-conscious, and we need a airway adjunct, I'm always, always, always going to pick an MPA, but understand something that the patient still is, it's, if they have no gag reflex, we're always switching back to the OPA. So if it does say semi-conscious with a gag reflex, then yes, we're going to be choosing this NPA. Some contraindications here, patient toler intolerance. Typically, that's what I've seen out in the field is when utilizing or attempting to utilize an MPA, people like... Even if they're altered, they still start screaming and they get like, uh, it's, it, it's, it's tough, man. Imagine someone's trying to stick something in the back of your nose. Um, facial fracture or skull fracture, it's uh, debatable. I know 
there was a uh, uh, been a lot of talk, and there have been cases in which people have put inserted uh, different medical tools, going to be uh, an NG tube, an ET tube, or even a NPA through the nose, and it has gone through a fracture of the skull. Um, and I know there's a lot of talk saying the likelihood is very small, but as of right now, it is still considered a contraindication. Advantages, you can suction through it. That is an advantage. Um, creates a pain airway, tolerated by responsive patients, if they can tolerate it, okay? Can be placed blindly, sure. You just gotta work that thing in. No requirement for the mouth to be open. Another good one. So if the patient does have trismus um, and they're not opening their mouth, I would tell you, there are other ways to obtain an airway, um, but you can. You don't have to open the mouth. You don't have to go through the mouth to access the nose to try to get an airway. Okay, measuring the NPA, uh, it's going to be from the nose, nostril to the earlobe. Or, so to measure this device, it's going to be from the nostril or the nose to the earlobe or angle of the mandible, either one. Both are in the textbook. So airway obstructions. Let's do it. Can be caused by a foreign body, most commonly the tongue, laryngeal edema, spasm, trauma, aspiration, allergic reaction, edema. Okay, so the first thing that gets brought up is the tongue. I'll be honest with you, this is usually what we'll see whenever we see an airway obstruction. It's usually the tongue, right? Uh, these patients are unresponsive. We hear snoring respirations. Uh, sometimes we hear very uh, bradypnea, slow respirations. And once we open an airway, the respiration starts to speed up and you don't hear the snoring anymore. Okay, so just be mindful of that. A lot of these patients, especially that are overdosed, uh, opioids, things of that sort, they need, uh, it's usually the tongue that's stopping them from breathing. It's not necessarily the opioids that have depressed their respiratory rate down to zero. Usually the patient is so weak that their tongue blocking their airway causes them not to breathe at all. Once we open the airway, they start to gasp for air. Seen it several times. Okay, so it says foreign body typical victim is a middle aged or older uh, with dentures or alcohol. This is this is truth. Okay, signs may include choking, gagging, strider, dyspnea. Okay, dysphonia. Or aphonia or dysphonia, right? That phonia just means talking, right? So aphonia means not talking, dysphonia, difficulty speaking, right? Um, absolutely. If a patient is able to speak to me, I always say if my patient's able to speak, they're not choking. So some people, they'll tell you, oh, no, I'm choking. I'm choking. I feel it. I feel it right here. Um, not really. Okay. If they have a really raspy voice uh, and they're barely able to get words out, now I'm a little bit more concerned. Okay, one thing uh, I want to always uh, very EMT or BLS is if they're able to make noises or they're able to breathe, they have what's known as a partial obstruction. We always encourage people to cough, 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 cough. And if they are, if they start coughing and then all of a sudden they stop making noises and they're unable to continue coughing, now they're choking. And then we can actually start performing life-saving skills to, to uh, take out that foreign body. A laryngeal spasm. A laryngeal spasm is just a spasming of the vocal cords. Okay, typically it happens when somebody uh, gets a foreign object that that goes down the wrong tube or the wrong pipe. Have you ever been drinking water and then all of a sudden it goes into your trachea instead of your esophagus? What do you feel like? You feel like you're going to die, right? That is a laryngeal spasm. Okay. Laryngeal edema, glottic opening narrows or totally closes. 
the, the examples here, inhalation injury, that would be like superheated gases. Somebody inhales uh, smoke, anaphylaxis or epiglottitis. These are airway inflammations, upper airway inflammations that can cause obstructions. Strider, no bueno. Says spasms and edema can be relieved by aggressive ventilation, forceful upward jaw pools, um, may be relieved by muscle relaxants, may recur, transport patient to hospital for evaluations. Now, when I, when I see aggressive ventilations, um, I think better terminology would be maybe aggressive airway management. If I have somebody who inhaled superheated gases, if I have upper airway swelling with uh, anaphylaxis, these are patients that I want to act quickly on and I need to maintain that airway. So by passing an intubation tube sooner rather than later is a really good idea, okay? Because if I don't, I might miss my opportunity and I might have to then perform a cricothyrotomy. The only one there in that example before that I wouldn't want to do that on would be my epiglottitis patient, which is going to be a child. The epiglottitis patient, I don't want to aggressively manage that airway because I will cause airway swelling and potentially that can kill the kid. So those kids are a little bit different. Um, we want to take those, take them to a hospital immediately, pediatric hospital, and they will most likely be performing surgery on that child's airway with epiglottitis. Laryngeal injuries, fracture of the larynx increases airway resistance. Absolutely. If somebody has a crushed larynx from taking a uh, blunt force trauma or technically any penetrating trauma can cause uh, a laryngeal injury to the neck, right? This can cause some serious airway compromise. Um, and sometimes, unfortunately, bad laryngeal injuries can make it almost impossible to obtain an airway. So cricothyrotomy is like probably one of your safest ways of obtaining that injury. But sometimes if you can't see what you're cutting, it makes it very challenging. Aspiration will increase mortality. Absolutely. Remember, aspiration is uh, breathing in uh, an outside or uh, a, a foreign path. Uh, Aspiration is breathing in a foreign body. So it could be water, it could be food, it could be something else. Uh, remember, we, it does not work out very well when you try to breathe in or aspirate anything other than air. It can, it'll obstruct the airway, destroy bronchial tissue, introduce pathogens into the lungs. Absolutely. A lot of issues. Recognition of an airway obstruction, mild obstruction. We talked about this. Patient uh, is responsive, able to exchange air. Um, they might have noisy respirations, coughing. It says, should be left alone. Closely monitor the patient. Be prepared to intervene because that patient might choke soon. So typically we would tell them to cough, right? To try to get that or to force that object out. Um, a severe obstruction, inability to breathe, talk, or cough. May grasp their throat and turn cyanotic. Now, what you see there is the universal choking sign, what that guy's doing. Um, this person is unable to move any air. Now, one thing I always tell people is most people, they choke, a severe choking, when they're eating, just like this guy, right? When they're eating, most people that die from choking, it's usually in like a bathroom because people get embarrassed and they run off to the bathroom. It's probably the worst thing that you can do. What I recommend is you jump up and go crazy, try to get everybody's attention, doing the universal choking sign, and try to get somebody uh, to assist you. Believe it or not, people die from choking all the time, and it is, it's more like a freak accident. The more people that know how to relieve choking, the better. Begin treatment immediately if choking is confirmed by a responsive patient. If large pieces of foreign body are found, sweep them out of the mouth with your finger. It's interesting that the book went straight to finger sweeps. But yes, if we ever look inside somebody's mouth and we can see something, always grab it. We don't do blind finger sweeps. Blind finger sweeps means that you would stick your finger in there and hope for the best. We don't do that. Okay. Try to hook the foreign body, dislodge it, suction if needed. 
Now, the abdominal thrusts. The abdominal thrusts are utilized for any patient that is a pediatric or an adult that is conscious, conscious and choking, pediatric and adult, not infant. Okay. Remember, our, our, we're going to place two hands up above the patient's navel, and we're going to go in and up, kind of like a J motion. We're going to do this as hard as we can and as many times as it takes for that object to either get dislodged or that person passes out as many times as it takes. If that person goes unresponsive, so let's say we're doing the Heimlich maneuver and then they pass out. What I want you to do is not just let them go, right? Because now we're going to have a trauma patient on top of this. I want you to nice and easy, gently place that person on the ground. First thing I would always recommend you do is look inside their mouth. Can you see something? If you can see it, grab it. If you don't see anything, let's start it up. We're doing chest compressions. If you're by yourself, we're doing 30 chest compressions. If you're with somebody else and it is a child or infant, we're going to do 15 to 2. 15 chest compressions to two breaths. Now, whenever we do give those breaths, my question to you is, did your breath go in? If you bag that patient and you feel resistance, it means that whatever's disl or whatever's lodged inside of that trachea is still there, right? We always readjust the head. Maybe it was user error. We try it again. Uh, it's, we still feel that uh, resistance. We're going to go right back into chest compressions. If techniques do not work, we're going to proceed to direct laryngoscopy. So with laryngoscopy, that just means that we're going to take an ET tube blade, intubation blade and handle, right? And we're going to insert it into our patient's mouth. We're going to lift up and we're going to look into the vocal cords and see if we can grab something. If you can grab something, we're going to be utilizing the McGill forceps. I'm going to be honest with you. I really don't care which hand you hold the McGill's and the uh, intubation handle for this skill. I know in with intubation, we always hold the blade with our left hand and our blades are designed so you can look on the right side of that blade. But some people, they get really weird with holding the McGill forceps. I would definitely recommend that you practice this, maybe even with both hands to see how it's most comfortable for you. This is like an emergency situation where we need to be able to grab whatever's in there quickly. Okay. So and I hope it's not your first time ever utilizing the McGills on an actual patient. Remember, too, the McGills come in, in uh, adult and child sizes. Moving right along, going into oxygen therapies. It says administer any patient with potential hypoxia. Well, what is hypoxia? Hypoxia is a oxygen saturation that is less than 94%. Okay. 94% is that cutoff. So we always want to keep patients above 94. Indications of patients in respiratory distress, suspected or documented hypoxemia. Now, I like what it says about oxygen delivery method. It is appropriate for ventilatory status. Okay. Appropriate for ventilatory status. Now, my patient's ventilatory status is going to dictate. What kind of oxygen therapy I'm providing? And this kind of goes back to a discussion that we had in part one, where I say, hey, what is the quality of my patient's breathing? If my patient's breathing shallow, even though they have a good rate, is me putting them on a nasal cannula going to be beneficial? No, because their oxygen, or I'm sorry, their ventilatory status is compromised, right? They have shallow respirations. I need to assist their breathing. But if my patient has, let's say, labored breathing at 30 breaths per minute, okay, well, they're having respiratory distress, but they're taking in air. It's not shallowed breathing. They're still, it's labored. They're still having difficulty breathing. But that changes the way that I might view this patient and how I treat them or manage them. Okay. So there's a lot of different ways that I'm going to be changing how I treat my patient with oxygen, depending on how my patient's ventilatory status is. Remember, we treat with oxygen and we treat with medications for patients that have 
respiratory distress. I BVM or I bag patients that are in respiratory failure. Okay, so we always want to make sure that we are paying attention to how that patient is uh, doing with their ventilations. One thing too, I want you to always pay attention to, just because it did say that uh, at the end there, adjust based on clinical condition and breathing adequacy. Uh, we can always adjust our oxygen based on our patient. So let's say that I do start with a non breather and my patient's starting to deteriorate. I, I'm not going to stay with a non breather. I can always upgrade to either a CPAP or I can upgrade to a BVM. And the same with the opposite, right? I could always downgrade if needed as well. Oxygen cylinders come in a lot of different varieties. Um, typically, what we see in EMS is Ds and Ms. Um, these are tank sizes. You, uh, D tank and jumbo Ds are usually what you're going to see on your stretcher. M tanks are what are on board on the trucks, the large cylinders that are up to three, uh, 3,000 PSI. Now, take a look at what it says about replacing the oxygen cylinder. Because so many people say it's, if it goes under 500, we're going to replace it. Um, I'm going to tell you right now, I know where I work. Under 500, we, we do replace. That's our policy. But take a look at what the national is saying. Replace cylinder when pressures fall under 200 PSI. Don't get that mistaken with your protocols. Okay, it says using pressure and flow rate, you can calculate how long supply will last. Now understand that these cylinders are going to have a exact amount of PSI in them. Okay, remember PSI stands for pounds per square inch. And let's say that something has 2000 pounds per square inch. Think of how much pressure is inside those bottles. 2000 pounds every inch on that bottle. Well, you might say, Mike, how on earth is all that air stay in there? Well, we trickle out that air using a regulator. So that regulator takes that extreme amount of pressure and it reduces it by a ton and allows you to get liters per minute. So we're able to use those bottles for longer periods of time thanks to the regulators. So keep combustibles out of the way, no smoking, store in a cool ventilated area. Um, use only with properly fitting regulators. One thing too, that I would like to tell you is always lay them down. If you are going to leave them, right? Don't allow these oxygen cylinders to be standing up and then people are walking around them. This is how accidents do occur. One thing that I do see on exams is they're here at the bottom. Have the cylinder hydrostatically tested every 10 years for you note takers, write that down. Here it is. High pressure regulator delivers gas under high pressures. Okay. It says pressure of the tank is 2000 PSI. Therapy regulator controls flows to the patient and reduces to 50 PSI. That sounds like a great test question to me. 50 PSI is what that regulator is going to reduce that to. A couple different examples of regulators that we're looking at here. Uh, different flow meters. Pressure compensated flow meter and a board on gauge flow meter. Typically, we see um, this style right here next to me at hospital settings, right? Uh, that wall outlet is considered a high pressure wall outlet, and they just hook up this pressure regulator. And that little black ball that's inside of there, it actually floats depending on the liters per minute that you are setting it to. One thing I would recommend all students is to make sure that you know how to properly put this cylinder together and with a regulator, because there will be a call in which you're going to have to troubleshoot it. I promise you. It says for uh, always inspect. Um, here we go. Inspect cylinder, then crack. Attach regulator flow to valve stem. Place a regulator collar. It, it would be a lot easier for me to, if I had it in hand and I could show it to you, um, definitely play around with your oxygen cylinder so you, you're comfortable with it. Jumping into oxygen therapies, first one we're going to be talking about is the non-rib breather mask. Uh, 
So the normal breather mask says preferred in the pre-hospital setting. I think normal breathers are awesome for a couple different reasons. Uh, first off, it provides a lot of oxygen. Look at that, 90 to 100% of oxygen. That's, a, uh, that's our FiO2, remember? Fracture of inspired oxygen, 90 to 100% oxygen. And there's masks, I'm sorry, under that mask, if you could see, we have a reservoir, uh, reservoir bag. That bag does fill up with air. If our patient is uh, tachypnic, or maybe they're breathing um, hyperventilating, they might breathe all the air outside of that reservoir bag. Doesn't mean that the oxygen is not flowing. So just make sure we always inflate that reservoir bag before placing it on our patient. It kind of also gives us a good indication of how, um, what our patient's ventilatory status is. If we start to see that bag getting uh, uh, depleted of air. Indications is spontaneously breathing patients. Absolutely. This is for a patient that, yes, is in respiratory distress, uh, but the patient had, and they can breathe on their own. They don't need us to assist with respirations. Contraindications is a patient that's apneic or not breathing or poor respiratory effort. Remember, what word did I use earlier? Shallow. This is not for shallow breathing patients. Nasal cannula, two prongs in the nose, 24 to 44%. Please remember that. You'll see that on exams. Um, that's for patients who need long-term therapies. They'll even put um, special devices on them uh, so that that doesn't rub on the patient's skin because these patients that have nasal cannulas for long periods of time, they'll literally wear it for months. When you have patients that have COPD, they wear it every single day. They even carry it around their house. Nasal cannula is probably the least invasive oxygen therapy that we'll be providing. A partial rebreather. Um, the difference between the partial rebreather, because it looks like a non-rebreather mask, the only difference is, look at the non-rebreather mask. Non-rebreather mask has these, um, these little valves here. Now, these valves are like a rubber material. We can pull the valves to make them a partial rebreather. Um, but the partial rebreathers here don't come with the valve. So a lot of the air kind of leaks out of the mask. A um, little different, really not seen much in EMS. One thing that I do like a lot about non-rebreather masks is it actually, a lot of the patient's CO2 is in the mask and the patient does have an opportunity to rebreathe their CO2. Um, so patients that are hyperventilating, non-rebreather masks work great with that. Venturi masks, another mask that is, does not have a lot of play in EMS. It delivers different levels of FiO2 depending on which um, little adapter you attach to it. But like I said, not really seen often. If you guys use it in your, uh, your uh, service, tell me about it. I'm curious what you guys do and what, what kind of patients you use it for. I'm just curious. Stomas. Here we go. It says you can cover the stoma with a tracheostomy with a tracheostomy mask. A tracheostomy mask, I'm gonna be honest with you, is typically a it's a child uh non-rebreather. Right? We'll take a child non-rebreather and we'll place it over the, the mask and we just flow it uh normally 15 liters per minute. Oxygen humidifiers, typically you see oxygen humidifiers out in, uh, in hospital settings, maybe on a CCT truck or critical care. In EMS or 911-based systems, we'd usually use a nebulizer. Uh, again, this is just, it's typically normal saline. They're using normal saline inside of a nebulizer. There are certain um, pathophysiologies that can benefit from nebulized water or saline. Another really good thing for humidified oxygen are our stoma patients. Okay, these patients, they bypass all of their humidifying capabilities of their oropharynx. Remember, your nose has the nasal turbinates that cause humidification to air. Um, all that's getting bypassed with a stoma. So instead of that patient humidifying their own air, 
they are EMS or even hospital staffs, they're going to have to provide humidified oxygen to that patient. All right, let's talk ventilatory support. So with ventilatory support, it's saying that this is for a patient who is not breathing and needs artificial ventilations and oxygen therapies. Now, one thing on this slide that scares me is its indications and treatment options. So indications says AMS or altered mental status and inadequate minute volume. I agree with it 100%, right? A patient that is altered mental and has a poor ventilatory um, status does require ventilatory support. Now, how do we provide ventilatory support with PPV? Positive pressure ventilations with a BVM. That's it, PPV. Not positive pressure through a CPAP, right, or a BiPAP. Um, typically, CPAP and or BiPAP, we're gonna be utilizing for a different type of patient. Um, it does provide positive pressure but I'm not going to be jumping to my CPAP for a patient that is altered or has low or inadequate minute volume, okay? So we'll get into when to utilize CPAP later on. So that kind of weirds me out about this slide. Normal ventilation versus positive pressure ventilation. Uh, this is actually something good to know uh, because you will see these on, on tests, okay? So with normal ventilation, the diaphragm contracts. I always want you to think, Whenever my diaphragm contracts, it gets out of the way. So my diaphragm contracts to allow my lungs to inflate with air. When my diaphragm relaxes, it pushes up against my lungs and helps expel the air during exhalation. There is always a negative pressure in my chest cavity. Okay, negative pressure in, the, in my chest cavity allows me to draw air in to my lungs so I don't have to work so hard to breathe. Positive pressure is kind of like the exact opposite. It's forcing air from the outside environment into my, into my lungs. Okay, it says generated by a device forces air into the chest cavity from the external environment. Um, so again, normal ventilations, I'm just... I have a negative pressure in my lungs and air is drawn into my lungs uh, versus an object that is forcing air into my lungs. It says with positive pressure ventilations, more air is needed to achieve the same effects of normal breathing, thus causing intrathoracic pressure. Now, hear me out. Intrathoracic pressure is a problem, okay? When we're providing PPV to a patient, or positive pressure ventilations to a patient and we're increasing intrathoracic pressure, we start to apply pressure to the vena cava. Now remember that vena cava is what provides preload to our heart, so it provides blood flow into our right atrium. And if we are creating an intrathoracic pressure and reducing preload, we are going to ultimately reduce cardiac output. Hence why blood flow is decreased says cardiac output is a function of stroke volume multiplied by the patient's heart rate. And remember, uh, cardiac output is reduced from hyperventilation or increased intrathoracic pressure using PPV. It says normally when a person breathes, air enters the trachea. Ventilations that are too forceful will not only decrease cardiac output, but will also cause something called gastric distension. Now, what gastric distension is, is air that gets accumulated in the stomach. And when air starts to get accumulated in the stomach, little bits of air, not that big of a deal. Too much air, big problems. Okay, so that patient with excessive gastric distension will actually vomit and increase the risk of aspiration and airway obstruction. Dangerous stuff. States assisting ventilations. Please understand that assisting ventilations is different than if I were to provide rescue breathing to a patient who is not breathing. Assisting ventilations typically means my patient is breathing, but I'm assisting them with their ventilations. So sometimes when we have a patient that's breathing, I'm still bagging them one breath every five to six seconds, but I am breathing with them. So when they inhale, I'm providing or assisting their ventilation. I'm not just counting to six and squeezing the bag, right? 
I'm assisting their ventilation. So it says squeeze the bag each time the patient inhales. We do not want to squeeze the bag during an exhalation. Can you imagine the patient's breathing out and you're trying to push air in? Not very effective. It says adjust your rate and tidal volume to maintain adequate minute volume. That is assisting ventilations. Artificial ventilations begin artificial ventilations immediately when the patient is not breathing. Now we get to count one breath every five to six seconds and we're going to provide that ventilation because a patient is not breathing on their own. This is known as artificial ventilations. I'll tell you right now, when it comes to the best way for providing artificial ventilations, it will always be the two person bag mask device technique. Okay, one person BVMing uh, works well if the person is very good with the CE clamp, uh, but everyone has different hand sizes. Uh, there's been a, a lot of studies going on that state that two people using a BVM is most effective. One person is holding the mask to the patient's face and providing that head tilt chin lift while the other patient or the other patient, the other person is squeezing the bag. Remember, one thing I want to tell you about these BV about these bags during BVM is the bags contain way more tidal volume than you need. Okay, so if I said that the average person's tidal volume in their lungs was 400 to 600 mLs, 600 mLs is a big person, okay? So most people are going to be 500 to 400 mLs. And then if I told you that an Ambu bag, to, by the way, Ambu is a, a um, company, right? That's a device name. It's not the actual device itself. Remember, the device is a bag valve mask. But if some of these bags contain up to 15, even 1600 mLs, it all depends on the manufacturer. Some might be 1200 to 1600. So just be mindful of that. You might be bagging way more tidal volume than you think by squeezing that entire bag. Hence why we say always look for chest rise and fall. That's how we know that we're getting adequate ventilations in. Mouth to mask, this is not very common, especially in the EMS realm. Um, you would probably use something like this if you lost your BVM, if there was a malfunction of the BVM, maybe you're getting your BVM ready, just doesn't see as much play, okay? Plastic barrier placed on the patient's face, one-way valve to prevent backflow of secretions. Uh, and you would just basically hold it on the patient's face while you breathe through the um, device. Remember, in the outside atmosphere, there's, what, 21% oxygen? That's what I'm breathing. But if I exhale, I'm not exhaling. It's 21%. Maybe about half that. Okay, it's just talking about how to position the patient, doing a head tail chin lift. Here's a good photo of somebody doing a mouth to mask. Again, on that mask, there's a one-way valve. So God forbid that patient starts to vomit. It's not going to go through the mask and into you. It'll get stopped at that one-way valve. But you see how he's holding this patient's uh, head in a head tail chin lift? Two hands. Good technique. Says to determine effectiveness, watch patient's chest rise and fall. Feel for resistance of the patient's lungs. Yes, if you have to blow too hard to allow for chest rise and fall, there might be resistance. Okay, it could be something blocking that airway. Here it is, the best. The best way of providing ventilations to a patient will be that BVM. BVM delivers nearly 100% oxygen. My face is nowhere near the patient's face, right? I could stand back uh, and provide adequate tidal volume safely. So here's that, what I was talking about. Total amount of gas in an adult BVM is between 12 and 1600 mLs. That of which we do not need for a, an adult so if you ever see somebody really squeezing that bag, just be mindful. They're giving way too much air. It should only be about half the bag squeeze. It says deliver each breath over a period of one second. That is 100% a test question. 
breath should only be provided over one second. We should not be giving prolonged breaths to patients. All we're looking for is that chest rise. Too forceful or too fast of breaths will cause gastric distension and again, reducing cardiac output. Reducing cardiac output. Inadequate tidal volume and oxygenation can occur um, usually in proper technique. One thing that they found to be unfortunately true about the use of BVMs is most users have a leak. Okay. Now the leak is going to happen with their CE clamp and how they keep that mask around the patient's face. If they're unable to properly position that mask to where there's a very good seal, then air is going to leak out of one side. Hence why utilizing more tidal volume within the BVM is effective. So now it's going to just show some different uh, techniques in which we utilize to perform a bag map bag valve mass technique. Now, one thing that I do want to point out, no one ever told me. I remember when I was a student, my first time ever bagging somebody. I was so excited. This person was unresponsive. I was on a ride time. And I remember I put the BVM on the patient's mouth. I opened their mouth. I put the BVM on and I started, I bagged and their mouth closed. I was like, man, this lady's not keeping her mouth open. I'm not going to be able to give her the air. Um, I tried multiple times to open up her mouth and her mouth kept closing on me when I went to, to bag her. Yeah, the mouth doesn't have to be open. No one ever told me that in school. Okay, air is just still going to get forced in around the nose, mouth. Um, it's not a big deal. I remember I was so confused though when I was a student. So it says, uh, place the mask on the patient, bring the lower jaw towards the mask, connect the bag. Uh, to the mask. Here's a photo of that two-person technique. Again, this is the best way to utilize that BBM. If I could give you any advice too, if you're the one squeezing the bag, I recommend to squeeze it further back on the bag. Okay, further back. I don't recommend to use like right in the middle of that BBM because it's. If you ever connect a BBM to an actual mannequin that tells you how many mLs you are. Uh, and putting in, you'd be shocked to see how how easy it is to overventilate a patient. It says squeeze every six seconds for the adult, two to three seconds for infants and children. This is one thing I do want to talk about because this did change. Okay, this textbook that we're looking at right now is the ninth edition. This changed uh, this year actually, and it's 2023. They uh, the textbook right before this was 2018, the eighth edition. And in that book, it said adults were one breath every five to six seconds and pediatrics were one breath every three to five seconds. That changed. And I think for the better, right? It's so now it's saying adults is always six seconds. So we can no longer have to think of ranges, uh, but there still is a range for pediatrics. I was really hoping to see one breath every three seconds, but instead of three to five, they added two to three. I know that was a really big push, a uh, really big push for the American Heart Association as well with their PALS update. One breath every two to three seconds. Um, same thing with actually advancing the airway. One breath every two to three seconds for children and infants. Big update. Says, if alone, hold your index finger over the lower part of the mask and your thumb over the upper part. We call this the CE clamp. Squeeze bag as patient inhales. Oh, yeah, remember, that's what we were calling uh, assisting ventilations. If patient hyperventilating first, assist at the rate at which the patient is breathing, then slowly adjust your rate and tidal volume. Um, remember, we're still trying to assist a breath every six seconds, and we're trying to adjust their rate. Um, I would tell you right now, patients that are hyperventilating, it's a it's a Big challenge if you're going to try to assist their breathing with a BVM, especially if they're like even semi-conscious. Taking over that airway might be your easiest bet. Ventilation's not adequate if the chest is not rising. Unable to hear breath sounds when auscultating the chest. Rate of ventilation is too slow or too fast. Or if the pulse rate or oxygen saturation does not improve. 
One thing I want to mention about pulse oximetry, and I know I talked about this in part one, is pulse oximetry is not always super accurate. So just be mindful of that. If you have a patient that's really dropping or deteriorating, if that patient's in shock, pay attention to your patient, right? Look at your patient's presentation. If you start bagging them, you're giving them fluids, you're doing things, and your patient looks like they're improving, but their oxygen saturation is not improving, it could be that they're, they have poor perfusion. Maybe their oxygen saturation is not going to be looking the best distally on their fingertips. Um, just be mindful of that. It might take a little bit of time. Don't think that you, the second you start bagging somebody, you're going to have, it's going to be shot right up to 98, 98, 99%. Uh, sometimes that's just not the way it works. It takes a little time. If the chest is not rising or falling, when you're delivering those breaths, we always, always, always try to consider this to be operator error, right? All that means is that we need to reposition that head and see if it's the tongue that's obstructing that trachea. Because what I'm guessing is that air is going into the stomach. Look what it says down here. If the stomach seems to be rising and falling, always reposition the head. Um, understand this. If we're utilizing the BVM for a long period of time, I'm always assuming that some of that air is getting into the stomach. Too much air into the stomach causes something called gastric distension and increases our risk of aspiration. And we need to limit that. This is why we need to get away from just BVMing, right? This is why we have to put an advanced airway in place. Automatic transport ventilators. These are something that we utilize once we do have an airway in place. And these small ventilators can actually continuously give breaths to our patients. Take a look at the variables of ventilation that it shows. Ventilation rate, how fast we're breathing. Idle volume, the amount of air with each breath. Peak respiratory time, the amount of air that's being forced either in and out of those lungs in one given time. Um, different modes that you can set, showing here minimum ventilations, uh, respiratory rate and volume synchronized with patient in initiated breaths. Okay, CIMV. Those are patients that are already breathing, and the uh, actual auto vent is breathing with the patient. Uh, pressure support says clinician selected amount of positive pressure or PEEP that that patient is required to have with each breath. So there's Depending on the actual auto vent that's being utilized, it has a lot of different variations and how it can be used. Um, and guess what? It doesn't mess up. There's no human error involved. Okay, that's the problem with us bagging people. Either we're breathing too slow, we're breathing too fast, we're breathing too much tidal volume, we're breathing too little tidal volume. So utilizing a device like this is actually very beneficial. It says steps for using it. Attached to a wall-mounted oxygen source. If you've been in a truck or at a hospital and you see those wall mounts that are there, remember those are high-pressure connections. We go ahead and push it into that high-pressure uh, line and it will charge the device. Okay, set a ventilatory rate, tidal volume, peak inspiratory time, connect the fitting to an ET tube or airway device, auscultate breath sounds, and observe chest rise. Now. One thing here is understand that this needs to be attached to an advanced airway. We're not going to be doing this with a BVM. Obviously, with a BVM, we'd be squeezing it ourselves. Um, this is something that we will utilize once the tube is in place. And the good part about this is it frees our hands. Okay. We could start working on something else. Always have a BVM available if it malfunctions. It says most models have adjustments for respiratory rate and tidal volume. Absolutely. Okay, generally consumes five liters per minute of oxygen. Uh, pressure relief valve can lead to hypoventilation, increased airway resistance and airway obstruction. Um, the pressure relief valve is there in case of these things. Well, not necessarily all of them, but airway obstruction, there's a pressure relief valve set on these ATVs in case um, there is something obstructing those breaths from going in. It'll literally blow the air out instead of causing barotrauma to our patients. So it's a good thing. CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure. Very good discussion. 
Let me move myself. That is quite the CPAP. Typically, you see something like that for uh, sleep apnea. That's not necessarily a CPAP that we would be utilizing in EMS. It says a non-invasive means of providing ventilatory support for patients with respiratory distress. Take a look at these indications. Increased pressure in the lungs. Oh, it says it increases pressure in the lungs. I'm sorry. Pushes oxygen across alveolar membranes and forces interstitial fluid back into circulation. So a couple things here that are very important that we need to know. First and foremost, collapse alveoli, right? Atelectasis. So we have alveoli that requires PEEP or positive end expiratory pressure to maintain those alveoli to remain open to allow for gas exchange to occur. If we have alveoli that are collapsing, we need positive pressure to maintain those alveoli to remain open. First thing, right? Next, pushes oxygen across an alveolar membrane. So it forces oxygen into the alveolar membrane which is great, right? We have a patient who is not satting where we need them to be, right? We want them to be greater than 94%. And let's say we throw on a non-breather mask and we are not, or it could be a nebulizer, and we're not achieving the oxygen saturations that we want. We can jump to a CPAP if our patient meets the indications to use it. Last but not least, forces interstitial fluid back into circulation where it belongs. Well, not necessarily where it belongs. That patient needs to rid of that interstitial fluid. Um, typically, they'll pee it out. But that fluid, unfortunately, is in the patient's lungs. This is why we would utilize our CPAP, right? We have excess fluid that's inside the bronchioles that it does not belong there. So we need to cause positive pressure to push that fluid out of the lungs. Easiest way that I always try to tell people is think of a sponge. If you soaked a sponge in water and then you took a high pressure hose or something that was going to blow air into the sponge, where would that water go? It would seep out of the sponge, right? Your lungs are no different. Okay. Don't think that your lungs are like this solid material. No, it's porous and your lungs will literally seep out that fluid under pressure. Typically delivered through a face mask secured with a strapping system. Pressure relief valve determines the amount of pressure delivered to the patient. Um, one thing that I do want to mention about CPAP and its straps. This is extremely important that we have a perfect seal around the patient's face. There cannot be any leaks. So if I'm not obtaining the positive and expiratory pressure that I'm looking for, which I believe we're going to be getting here to in a minute, if I'm not getting the amount of pressure that I want being delivered to my patient, it means that there's a leak somewhere. So typically what I'll do is I'll take my hands and I'll place it around the patient's mask to find that leak. And let's say I find it here around the jawline. Well, guess what? I'm going to take the straps here at the jaw and I'm going to pull them back, kind of like an SCBA for those of you who are in the fire service, back to try to tighten it so I don't have a leak down here at the bottom. Take a look at these guidelines. You have to know this. As a provider, as a student taking an exam, as somebody who is going to be practicing maybe in scenarios, first guideline, patient is alert and able to follow commands. Has to be, right? At no point. Would I ever apply a CPAP to somebody who can't answer questions? Like if I'm talking to somebody and they're not even able to tell me like, hey, I'm short of breath or hey, what's your name? And they can't answer those kind of questions. They're not getting a CPAP. Okay. If my patient is that altered, they are going into something called respiratory failure and we need to take over their airway. Even that statement's a little strong just because why are they altered? Maybe they have pinpoint pupils and we could just correct that really easily. But I'm saying if they are altered because of their respiratory rate and because they're that hypoxic that they're now altered, that's when we need to step in and say, no, we're not going to play CPAP on this patient. We're going to take over their airway. But if they have like a low BGL or something, we're not going to take over their airway, right? We're going to go ahead and assess the sugar and we're going to fix that. 
Uh, this is why we play paramedic. Next, obvious signs of respiratory distress from an underlying disease or after submersion. What did it say there? Respiratory what? Distress. CPAP is used for patients in respiratory distress, not respiratory failure, not respiratory arrest. Underlying disease, absolutely. We, this can be utilized in COPD, could be utilized in asthma, can definitely be utilized in CHF. Submersion underwater, right? Patient has rails or, or crackles in their lung sounds. Rapid breathing that affects overall minute volume, okay? Rapid breathing that affects overall minute volume and a pulse oximetry less than 90%. Um, not that big on those last two, and I'll explain myself. Um, a patient can, just can start breathing so fast that they become, uh, or they start to hypoventilate. Even though the respiratory rate is increasing, because of how fast they're breathing, their actual minute volume starts to decrease because of the lack of tidal volume. Patients that have a lack of tidal volume don't do the best with CPAP. Those patients are typically like circling our, the drain and they start to go into respiratory failure. Uh, pulse oximetry of less than 90%. Uh, most of these patients will have a pulse oximetry less than 90%. When, especially when they have, um, when they're full with rails. But sometimes we get patients where we hear rails and it's very minor and their pulse oximetry might be above 90%, but they're feeling a little bit short of breath, a little tachypnic, we'll throw it on. So don't think that the patient has to be less than 90 for me to ever utilize a CPAP. I think it's just frequently seen that these patients really desaturate. Remember, the ox or I'm sorry, the fluid that is inside those lungs, inside the bronchioles, they start to wash out something called surfactant. I believe I did talk about this already. Um, it washes out surfactant, and that surfactant helps those alveoli open and close. So those alveoli uh, remain closed, and there's no gas exchange. So these patients, they really desaturate, and that's something we need to pay attention to. Contraindications. If you know the indications, you got to know the contraindications. The first one, again, is unable to follow commands. I have to be able to coach these patients on CPAP. And what that looks like is like this. If I say, sir, take a look at me. Look at me while you're taking a breath. Breathe like me. I really emphasize my exhalation. Why am I emphasizing my exhalation? Because remember, I'm trying to achieve something called a positive end expiratory pressure. As my patient exhales, the CPAP is blowing continuous positive air towards my patient's face. So they're breathing out, that air is blowing into their face, and it's creating pressure. So I have to really emphasize the exhalation. If my patient's unable to follow those commands, they can't have the CPAP on their face. Respiratory arrests or agonal respirations, again, those are uh, no bueno. We're not putting those on those patients. If the patient is so short of breath that they're unable to speak, these patients have de uh, desaturated. Uh, we call these like, de they're kind of like decompensated. Um, I know it's not shock, but they've like, their respiratory rate has decompensated to a point where this patient's going into respiratory failure. Patients that are hypoventilating, same concept. Hypotension. Hypotension. Low blood pressures, systolics less than 90. We do not put CPAP on these patients. Understand what CPAP does to your chest. It's continuous positive pressure. So it's blowing continuous air into that patient's lungs. And that continuous pressure actually builds up an intrathoracic pressure. Or it creates pressure inside the chest. Well, unfortunately, some of that pressure starts to push on the, the superior inferior vena cava, and we actually have a decrease in what's known as cardiac output. So if I drop preload by putting a CPAP on somebody's face, what do you think is going to happen to their blood pressure? It's going to drop. So if I have a patient that already has a low blood pressure, 
then I'm going to make it worse. Please hear me out. If you have a patient that is full and they look like they're in shock, they look cool, pale, diaphoretic. Um, they don't look good. They don't look like they're perfusing very well. I need you to check a manual blood pressure. Do not rely on your monitor's blood pressure. You have to get a manual blood pressure before putting the CPAP on them, before giving them nitrates, before considering Lasix, right? We need to know what this patient's pressure is. And usually if I see a patient like that, it's telling me that they waited too long to contact EMS. Another contraindication on here is pneumothorax or chest trauma. Understand again that there is an increase in intrathoracic pressure and we can furthermore cause barrow trauma to that, those, that patient's lungs. So just be mindful of it. Closed head injury, same concept. We increase pressure by blowing air. We can cause uh, potential ICP, intracranial pressure. Any facial trauma that might impede on that mask's seal is a problem, okay? So any sort of facial trauma, we try to stay away from CPAP. Cardiogenic shock. I love seeing that on here as a contraindication. Why? Because you're going to want to put a CPAP on these patients. You're going to show up. You're going to look at them and say, whoa, they sound really full. You're going to listen to their lung sounds heavy rails or crackles, and you're going to say CPAP. But guess what? This patient's going to look pale. They're going to look diaphoretic. And when you put a, um, a blood pressure cuff on them, you're going to note that their blood pressure is lower than normal. These patients do not need a CPAP. And I've already discussed why and what's going to happen if you put a CPAP on them. You actually need pressors and a non rebreather for these patients and even consider intubation and taking over the airway depending on their respiratory status. Patients, patients with a tracheostomy, obviously if they have a stoma or if they are not using their mouth to for their ventilations, you putting a CPAP is not going to assist them in any which way. GI bleeding, nausea, vomiting. Um, any patient that you're suspecting is gonna be vomiting is a problem with CPAP recent GI surgeries, okay? Increasing pressures can cause problems there. If the patient is unable to sit up, that is, this is telling me that the patient is so weak that they can't sit up and they have to lay down, these patients are going to buy themselves a tube or intubation. Understand that. You're unable to fit the CPAP system. Obviously, we need have to have a perfect seal for this to work. And someone, and the last one there is they cannot tolerate the mask. So a patient that is uh, that requires CPAP and that is unable to tolerate a mask is somebody that you're going to run into. Okay. You're going to run into that patient. And if the patient keeps ripping the mask off because they feel claustrophobic, the mask isn't doing its job. And these patients require that continuous positive pressure. What I require you or, or challenge you to do is to help them relax. You can use very low dose sedatives we can use different techniques to help this patient calm down and we need to coach them into using this mask, maybe putting it on their face and holding on to it and even allowing them to hold on to it and then take it away. Okay. Take a couple deep breaths. Let's put it back on your face, right? We're trying to coach them to get them used to that mask. Um, we need to do our best to get the mask on their face to where they can tolerate it. Low dose first said uh, is another thing that can work great for these patients. Okay, this is just telling you how the CPAP comes packaged. Um, here we go. If you're, for my note takers, patient exhales against resistance, and this is known as positive end, what? Expiratory pressure. Take a look. Therapeutic range, you have to know it. Five to 10 centimeters of water. Um, I always say we start at five and work our way up. Your protocols might say, depending on the patient's presentation, start at 10 or maybe start at 7.5. Uh, that's typically how we move in centimeters of water, by the way. We do 5, 7.5, and then 10. 10 is the max. Remember, that's the therapeutic range. So again, 5, 
7.5 and then 10. It says some units use a continuous flow of oxygen, other use oxygen on demand. Um, typically, we're using a continuous flow of oxygen. Uh, we're not adjusting FiO2. Maybe that's something that they will have at a vent, on, on a vent inside the hospital. Typically, they'd be put, placing these patients on bi-level uh, PAP, but usually not with CPAP. Um, we talked about claustrophobia. It says air can enter the stomach. Remember, these patients have to be able to be coached to, to breathe. We talked about those stuff. Um, I just I, I mentioned gastric distension a little bit earlier. Typically, gastric distension is seen with uh, positive pressure ventilations. Not just talking about CPAP. Uh, it's usually from too much or overinflation of either the BVM or improper positioning of the patient's head during positive pressure ventilations. Top two things there. It says harmful for two reasons. First, promotes regurgitation and will lead to aspiration. Remember, these patients will vomit on you if you provide too much air into their stomach. Number two, it will push the diaphragm up, limiting the amount of expansion or volume that your lungs will have to inflate with air. So you're actually reducing the amount of air that your lungs can take and you're increasing the chance of aspiration. Two really bad things. It says signs that you might know that your patient has gastric distension and increased diameter of their abdomen or a distended abdomen, increased resistance while bagging. Um, it's going to get worse or harder to bag as those um, as that pressure increases inside the abdomen. Pay attention to your patient. OK, don't just talk to somebody else while you're bagging somebody. Um, and I always say this. If for whatever reason you have a failed intubation attempt, and I know we're going to be talking about intubation in this lecture, but if you have a failed intubation attempt, use another device. Don't think that you're just going to go straight to BVMing the entire way. And if you have a long transport time and you make the decision that, hey, we need to bag this patient for a long period of time, just know that this patient's going to require a gastric tube. That's all. Signs are noted, reassess, reposition the airway, observe for chest rise and fall, limit ventilation time to one second. Uh, we shouldn't be doing long ventilations because there's only so much air that could go in the chest, man. This is why we say, look for chest rise and fall. As soon as you see that chest rise, stop your ventilations. We don't need to squeeze that entire bag. It's too much tidal volume. Gastric decompression, I just mentioned it, involves inserting a gastric tube. Uh, there's a couple different ways. We can either go by nose or by mouth. On oh, It's just all the considerations. For any patient who will need positive pressure ventilation for extended periods of time, uh, or a patient when a gastric distension interferes with your ventilations, we're going to apply a gastric tube. So this first one that is showing you is an NG tube. An NG tube stands for nasogastric tube. Um, obviously, it inserts through the nose. Um, easiest way to measure this, you're going to go, you're, you'll take the tip of that NG tube. Um, let me see if I can, I, I don't have an NG tube, but I'm going to use this cable as an example. So I have a, a cable here. I'm going to take the tip of that tube and I'm going to place it on the patient's nose. It's going to go up around the patient's ear, down all the way to the patient's xiphoid process. Once I have that location, I'm going to go ahead and mark that spot with tape, okay? And then I'm going to take the distal end of that tube, and I'm going to insert it into their nose, and it's going to go straight back all the way to I get to that point with my tape. Once it's there, then I'm going to go ahead and secure that to my patient's face, and I can start my suctioning. Okay. OG tube, same concept. Um, mouth to the ear down, xiphoid process. Uh, typically, whenever you're inserting a device 
that we utilize for airway management, either through the nose or the mouth. Uh, usually nose is for semi-conscious or awake and alert patients with a gag reflex. Uh, mouth is for patients to, who are unresponsive with no gag reflex. It says by mouth is always safer with patients with severe facial trauma. OG tube, less comfortable for responsive patients, preferred for unresponsive with ga without gags. Exactly what I just said. Um, laryngectomy, surgical removal of the larynx. Tracheostomy creates stoma. Okay, it says a total laryngectomy, the patient will breathe through the stoma, cannot ventilate with a BVM. Partial laryngectomy breathes through the stoma and uses their nose and mouth. Very interesting. Suctioning the stoma. Uh, suctioning stomas can be pretty disgusting. I'll be honest with you. Uh, my first time ever really getting into this is when I was a student. I worked private ambulance and there, we would transport a lot of interfacility transports with patients that had stomas. Typically, if the patient has a stoma for any sort of period of time, they know when they need suctioning. So I, I may always made it a habit to ask, do you want to be suctioned? And they will either give me the yes or the no. Okay. Um, they're very capable of doing so. If they do want suctioning, what we're going to do is we're going to take a whistle tip. Remember the French tip or the flexible tubing for suctioning. And you want to pick the biggest diameter that's going to fit through the stoma. So don't pick anything that's really narrow. And the reason why I say is because of mucus plugs. Remember, these patients no longer have humidification with their air. And because of that, they start to create really, really thick mucus uh, that blocks their stoma. And like I said, it can get pretty gross. So sometimes we'll take a rag or something to clean around the stoma because a lot of that gets hacked up out of the stoma. So we'll take that whistle tip. We're going to start dropping it down, 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 down. The patient, once it hits down, by the carina, the patient's going to start to grimace. They're going to start to show that they're, it looks like a gag and they're coughing and they're basically pushing that phlegm up. Once the, once we see that, we initiate the suction. Remember, we're going to limit it to 10 seconds because this is considered an advanced airway. So we're going to limit to 10 seconds. What I recommend is to twirl it back and forth on the way up and out. So we're pulling that suction out of the patient's stoma. Um, and it usually works pretty well. If we're unable to get anything up because it's so thick, we can utilize a little bit of saline to mix down into their stoma um, or down the tube if we need to suction up and out of the tube. Same concept. Fun stuff. All right, ventilations of stoma patients, head tilt, chin lift, and jaw thrusts are not required because their airway uh, is not in their oropharynx, all right? If no tracheostomy tube is available, mouth to stoma technique, no thank you, uh, bag mass device uh, is going to be preferred. Just remember, we cannot utilize an adult mask, which is pretty big, to put on the patient's neck. So what it says here is use an infant or child size mask to make an adequate seal. Absolutely. I would take a uh, infant size mask is usually what I would consider using. It'll place right over the stoma and we can ventilate the patient from there. Two rescuers are needed to bag these patients. Remember, there's no CE clamp. We're not gonna put our, our hands around the patient's jaw. One is just holding it around this, uh, the stoma. Another person's bagging. Tracheostomy tube. Here's a uh, photo of a little kid with one. Smaller tube. Okay, it says plastic tube within the stoma. Patients may receive oxygen via the tubing design to fit over the tube. Place an oxygen mask over the tube. Um, that's another way that we can passively ventilate them. Patients who experience sudden dyspnea often have thick secretions. This is very common for patients with stomas. Like I said, they don't have the humidification and they get a backup of that mucus. 
I don't think I need to hit that anymore. Dental appliances. This is something that I I current I do see in the zone that I work in. Uh, I work with a lot of elderly people, and we do see a lot of dentures and um, dental appliances. What I recommend is to remove them if possible. If I need to perform advanced airway procedures on these patients, the last thing I want is an obstruction, and dental appliances are an obstruction. So make, make sure that they fit well. Take care if airway obstruction is caused by a bridge because uh, it can lacerate the pharynx or larynx. Uh, says best to remove them. Absolutely. Uh, get rid of them. Just don't lose them. Okay, These things are expensive, uh, and your patients aren't going to like you too much if you lose their expensive equipment. Let me get my, my head out of the way here. Facial trauma. Uh, so dirty airways can be really problematic. Uh, facial trauma, uh, trauma in general, can make uh, advancing an airway really challenging for us. It says severe swelling and bleeding in the airway can be present. Control with direct pressure. If possible, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, Direct pressure is great outside of the patient's uh, mouth uh, or around the patient's face, but anything inside the mouth, doing holding direct pressure is very challenging. Uh, suction is going to be your friend. Suction and positioning is going to be your friend. It says inadequate breathing, severe oral pharyngeal bleeding may be present. Suction, airway until clear. Ventilate the patient if bleeding cannot be controlled. Uh, continuous suctioning and intubate the trachea. Absolutely. Uh, there's something called a salad technique that I would recommend you to take note of salad and watch some videos on it. Uh, Dr. Ducanto came out with a great device called the Ducanto suction device, um, used to intubate patients with dirty airways. There's different techniques that can be utilized out there, sitting patients up, uh, which can be really challenging if you're using backboards but there are different techniques that you can utilize. One thing that I do find very effective is having a minimum of two people to, to intubate somebody. Um, if I ever have a really dirty airway and I'm trying to assist somebody in, in, an intubate, in, in an intubation, sorry, what I'll do is I'll hold on to the patient's mouth like this and I'll pull down while I suction, usually with a whistle tip if possible, uh, along the side of the patient's oral pharynx while the other person is doing the innovation. Uh, again, the salad technique has shows you different ways of doing it yourself. Um, this does require training and practice. So don't, please don't think that um, the first time you should be doing this is on an actual person. I recommend practicing this and watching some videos on dirty airways. Cervical spine injuries, uh, of course, if we have a patient with severe facial trauma, and we're worried about um, spinal cord injury, we need to protect their cervical spine. Please don't just say, well, airway is gonna take precedent over that, so I don't care, I'm still gonna hyperextend their head back. But we can do all these procedures with a C-collar on, I'm just being honest with you. Endotracheal innovation of a trauma patient is most effectively performed by two paramedics. It's just the truth. If you're unable to effectively ventilate or intubate, perform a cricothyrotomy, which we'll be talking about. Jumping into advanced airway management. One of the most common mistakes with respiratory and cardiac arrest is the use of advanced techniques too early. Very interesting statement, and I like it actually because this is true. Too many times are paramedics and firefighters so focused on getting a tube early on um, that they actually hurt the sequence of CPR and the, uh, the effectiveness of their chest compressions. If there's one thing that I can say to you about this topic is do chest compressions. Focus on defibrillation. Focus on chest compressions. Airway comes next. And when I say airway comes next, ventilations come next, not advancing the airway, okay? Advancing the airway is something that I'm going to think about, you know, once everything is is under control. Now, a lot of people ask me, they say, Mike, you know, when when should I advance the airway then? Well, should I wait till the third shock or the third round of CPR? 
And my answer to that is there is no answer for that. It's going to come down to how many hands do you have on scene? Do I have continuous chest compressions without a problem? Good. Do I have someone able to ventilate? Good. Do I have somebody at the monitor? Do I have another compressor that can switch with these people? Do I have someone able to push medications? Awesome. If I have someone else just standing around, I, yeah, let's start preparing for the innovation. I don't need to wait till my second or third uh, cycle to consider advancing an airway. If I have the, the enough hands there now, I, I can start preparing for my, adva my advancing my, of my airway. If I don't have those hands available, then I'm not worried about it. I'm more worried about the cardiac arrest. Okay, so, so just understand that. Uh, I'm not so focused on advancing my airway immediately. It's just not a necessity. Primary reasons for advancing an airway. You have to know this. Note takers, failure to maintain a patent airway is number one. Failure to maintain a patent airway. And what can impede or ruin my patient's airway? There's a lot of things. An obstruction, aspiration or vomit, right? Um, maybe my patient's head positioning. Number two here, it says failure to adequately oxygenate and ventilate. If I, if I fail to adequately oxygenate and ventilate, it's not telling me that, hey, you know, you, you didn't BVM when you were supposed to. No, it's saying that you are attempting ventilation of this patient and you are failing at it. Maybe it's because the patient is unable to move their head in a certain position to open the airway. Uh, maybe it's because something is blocking the airway. I don't know. But there's something that is impeding your you as the provider to ventilate our patient. This patient requires an advanced airway, okay? Um, another one, if my patient is unable to maintain their own airway, like if my patient is unable to maintain their own breaths or their, or their respirations are becoming really shallow or my patient starts to hypoventilate, this patient's going to require assistance by you, a provider. And what's the issue with me just sitting here and saying, okay, I understand that. I'm, I'm going to start bagging this guy. And I lay him back and I start bagging him. Are we cool? Are we good? Kind of. But what, what did we just talk about with BVMing a patient? As I bag these patients over time, I cause gastric distension and my patient will deteriorate. We need to get an advanced airway in place. We'll talk a little bit about lemon. So the lemon mnemonic, look externally. So with lemon, we're looking for a patient um, who is going to be a challenging airway. And I'm going to tell you right now, as you start to gain experience as a paramedic, you're going to start looking at people a little bit differently. And sometimes you'll look at someone and you're like, man, that guy would be a really easy innovation. And there's other people you're like, that guy would be a nightmare to innovate. Short, thick necks. They call them bull necks. People that have no neck, right? Or they're just like all head and then just straight shoulders. Really challenging innovations. Patients that are morbidly obese can be really challenging. Dental conditions. Uh, maybe someone that has really prominent front teeth where there's a really high chance that when you put the blade into the patient's mouth and you lift up, the back of the blade might hit that those patient's teeth. You got to be conscious of these things. By just looking at a patient's mouth, we should be able to tell if this patient's going to have, if there's going to be a challenge to the innovation. So this is called a Mal and Patty score. Let me move my head out of the way here. Okay. Uh, three, three, two. Well, actually, so this is not the mountain patty. Mountain patty is when they stick out their tongue. Um, this is a three, three, two rule. If we should be able to fit three fingers into the patient's mouth, you should be able to have three fingers between the mandible. Um, it says mandible length. Okay. Down to the patient's, the base of their neck. Um, and then the distance of the patient's hyoid bone. 
to the thyroid notch. Okay. Remember the, th the hyoid bone is a bone that kind of attaches to your tongue. Uh, so the base of your neck down to your thyroid notch, uh, you should be able to fit at least two fingers in that space. Um, 332 rule doesn't get seen. At least I haven't, I don't see a lot of providers do utilizing it. I've seen more people use the Malin Patty score looking inside the patient's mouth than I have a 332 rule. But it does work. It's one of those things that you might see doctors usually using. Here's a Malin Patty score. Um, as you can see in this, these four different views, we got a patient uh, directly here. This is the best view. If you have somebody open up their mouth, stick out their tongue, and you can see their uvula, no problem. And look at that space underneath the uvula. Perfect. Yes, that's a very good sign for an easy intubation. Uh, a class two, you can still see the uvula, but there's no uh, space underneath that uvula. Um, that's a class two. Class three, it's getting a little bit more challenging. You could see a little bit of where that uvula should be. And then obviously a class four, it's just all tongue. And I'm going to be honest with you, I've had each one of these patients. Um, some patients, I open up their mouth and I'm like, what am I looking at? Why is this person's tongue so massive? Uh, just be mindful. It's not always angioedema that's causing swelling of the airway or tongue. Uh, some people, they just anatomically, that's just how their mouth is made. Okay. But that's a Mal and Patty score. Love this. Okay. So these are different classes of view. Okay, so different classes of view, and I'm gonna move myself over here to a class one. Um, best view that we can see. Now, what I'm talking about right now is for innovation, right? So I open up my patient's mouth. I've already chose my tool. I know I'm going in, and as I can see where this, place, where this person is putting the blade in which they're innovating with, they're using a Mac blade. Oh, excuse me, but I get to see what their view is, and I can kind of judge uh, is this going to be a successful innovation or not just by the view? doesn't mean that it's always true. You know, this person might have some tricks up their sleeves, but seeing a class one view uh, is perfect, right? We could see the vocal cords here. We know exactly where we're going. Uh, if you can see where that blade is sitting, it's just above that epiglottis. That's that uh, piece of tissue right in here, this round thing. Okay, that's the epiglottis. And they're placing that blade right at the base of it and indirectly lifting up to view those vocal cords. Um, I kind of wish this slide was later on after we talk equipment and everything. Um, but it's okay. I know they want to discuss the lemon law. Number two, I can still see the epiglottis. I have a very good view of the epiglottis. I'm able to indirectly lift up that epiglottis, I can start to see the base of that glottic opening. I know where the glottic opening is. I can still innovate this patient. I just need to curve that tube a little bit. Um, typically, we'll curve the tube like a hockey stick, and I can kind of guide that tube in place. Number three, move myself. This is a number three view. Uh, number threes are, are really challenging. Typically, if I start to see a number three view after I place a blade inside somebody's mouth, I've know I know that my blade is too short. I couldn't get far enough into the mouth. Um, I need to change my equipment. I'm not going to stick with the same blade if I look inside the mouth and I'm using good technique and I see a class three view. Um, same concept right here with a class four. The worst view possible. Okay, if you see a class four view, you got some serious issues. You pick the worst piece of equipment possible. Um, the, or this person's airway is just very far down. Remember, everyone's airway is a little bit different. So if you see a three or a four, just know we got to change our equipment. And that's one thing that I'm going to be talking a lot about when we discuss innovation. Obstruction. So we just talked about look, evaluate. M for uh, Malin Patty. And then O for obstruction. No, anything that might interfere with visualization of the ET2 placement. If you see something that's blocking your view and we cannot see 
where this tube is going, we're unable to innovate. Okay, that's a problem. We're probably going to be performing a open cricothyrotomy on that patient. N stands for neck mobility. Sniffing position is ideal. Remember, sniffing position means that the patient's nose is the highest part of their face. We shouldn't have to hyperextend the patient's head back when we're innovating. Um, even though, as long as you have good neck mobility and you're not worried about C-spine, we can manipulate the neck as needed. But understand the sniffing position is ideal positioning for a patient with intubation. Neck mobility problems are most common in trauma patient or the elderly. I have had these patients where they have fused vertebrae in their cervical spine and you're unable to move their head at all. Um, I have ran into that with some elderly patients with intubation. If that ever happens to you, just as a heads up, use two people, okay? Use a two-person technique. We call it face-to-face. -face. We, we call it gaffing. Um, one person's holding the blade and pulling, the other person's actually performing the intubation. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, look it up, face-to-face -face intubations. Those are best for patients that either have a C-collar on or a patient with limited mobility. Talking about endotracheal intubation, ET2 passes through the glottic opening and is sealed with a cuff inflated against the tracheal wall. Um, because there's two different types, oral tracheal intubation and nasal tracheal intubation. Remember, this is the number one best way of providing a, um, an airway for a patient. This is an advanced airway, and it's the best one. As some advantages, it'll secure your airway. Your patient's height won't aspirate. Your patient won't choke, right? We have a perfect tube that is providing air to the patient's lungs. And that's it. I don't care if there's vomit in the patient's mouth, if the patient has a is bleeding in their oral pharynx. I don't care, right? Because I got a tube in place and I'm able to ventilate the patient efficiently. Some disadvantages that require special equipment, obviously special training, and physiologic functions uh, are bypassed. And what physiological functions are that? Humidification. So long-term ventilation uh, for a patient that is intubated is going to require a vent. And these vents are going to have to have humidifiers and all this stuff because it's bypassing all those uh, human functions. A lot of complications with uh, intubation, especially if they're not done correctly or if they are done too forcefully. Technique plays an important role in successful intubation. So some, compli some complications that you're going to see here, bleeding, laryngeal swelling, uh, damage to the vocal cords, barotrauma. A lot of these in involve trauma. Now, why, why would these involve trauma? It's the provider that's performing the skill. We need to focus more on providing air to the patient. If we have a lot of providers that are not comfortable with intubation, and let's say one person tries, and they're like, ah, I just don't see anything. I, I'm having a hard time. And then another person says, well, let me try. And you give them the blade. They stick it in the patient's mouth and they lift up and they're like, oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, I don't see anything either. And then someone says, let me try. And then they put the blade in and then they lift up. These tries are causing trauma to the patient's oral pharynx. It's going to cause swelling. It's going to cause bleeding. You could cause damage to the vocal cords. This is, this is problematic. If you are intubating a patient, it means that you've been trained to intubate. You know the techniques. If you open up somebody's mouth and you don't see anything, or you, you're like, man, I, I'm having a really hard time visualizing, guess what? You need to change your equipment. I'm okay with you backing up and saying, hey, this is, looks like a difficult airway. Um, I, I'm unable to visualize the glottic opening. Let's use a longer blade. Maybe we'll go to a Miller blade or something of that sort. But I want to, someone else could can look. I'm cool with you doing that. But don't just keep passing the same blade and causing more and more trauma to the patient's oral pharynx, if that makes sense. Hypoxia, if you're doing too long of an attempt to innovate a patient, you're going to cause hypoxia to them. Please, no more than 30 seconds for an innovation attempt. You should be bagging these patients. Uh, pre-oxygenating them at least two to three minutes before your intubation 
and limiting your innovation time. Laryngospasm, that's just telling you that this patient's uh, vocal cords are closing as you're trying to innovate. That means your patient's requiring some more sedation. Let's take a look at this tube. Some important uh, things on the tube that you need to know. There's a 15 millimeter adapter that's up there at the top. Uh, that's how we hook up our BVM. Coming down, we have this pilot balloon. Let me move myself over so I can point. This line here that fills up a pilot balloon that needs to be filled by a 10 cc syringe. Now this pilot balloon, when it's inflated, it's telling me, the provider, that this distal cuff is inflated. If the pilot balloon is not inflated, it means the distal cuff is not inflated. The reason why it's there is because obviously when this distal end is inside the patient, I don't know if it remained inflated. So how do we know? We look at the pilot balloon. A lot of different tube sizes. It says uh, two to 10 millimeter inside diameters of those tubes. They do get wider as the numbers get la uh, larger. It goes up to 32 centimeters in length. And we have a 5 to a 10 millimeter equipped with a distal cuff. Now, I believe that is going to change over time. I, I want to say anything that they're, they're going to start implementing more cuffed tubes that are smaller. And this is based on a study that was released in the latest Cow's uh, algorithm saying that, hey, all ages can now use uh, cuffed tubes. It used to be non-cuffed for certain ages, uh, not anymore. Okay, semi-rigid wire that's inserted into the ET tube is known as a stylet. The stylet is what allows us to make the, the, the tube bend. I can make a a hockey stick looking tube. I could turn it more like a U shape. I could change things as needed, uh, thanks to the stylet. Um, one thing that I do want to tell you about the stylet is the end should rest at least 0.5 inches from the end of the ET tube. So half an inch from the end of the ET tube. At the base of that ET tube, let me see if there is a, uh, it's hard to tell on these tubes. There's a hole at the base of the tube, should be right around here, it's called the Murphy's eye or the Murphy's lens. That stylet that goes through the tube should never pass that Murphy's eye or the Murphy's lens, okay? It should always be before that. So that's one way to help you always remember like, hey, how far should I place a stylet? Should never pass that little opening. Here's a good one uh, for note takers. 2.5 to 5.0 tubes are used for peds, pediatric size. <clears throat> I know it says no need for distal cuffs in most cases. Uh, again, this has changed in the most recent algorithms. Uh, so I'm very curious to see if this is going to be changing in uh, standardized textbooks in the future. Anatomical clues for tube size. Please write this one down as well. Internal diameter of the nostril. Um, so if you look at uh, at a person's dominant nair, so a dominant nair is a one nose or nair that is larger than the other. That diameter should be around the same exact size as that person's glottic opening. So that's a good trivia type question. Uh, the most your dominant nair is the same size. Another good one is the diameter of your pinky finger. Okay, the diameter of the patient's pinky is the same size as their glottic opening. So if sometimes you're not quite sure what size tube you should grab, that is one thing you can do: grab the patient's pinky or take a look at their dominant nair to make a judgment call. So as always, have three different sizes available. Uh, when performing this innovation, just in case.